Here is form 1290. Oh, wait, you're trying to get a permit for this Friday? You would need... 1290B expedited request and a 1021J adjustment waiver and a sweet, sweet P28P supplemental. Right. There's just one problem. What? No. I did absolutely everything. The 1021J has to be submitted with an approved 1290. But I'm submitting the 1021J to get the 1290 approved. That doesn't make any sense. In researching the various videos I've already done on this channel, the field working for the government is mixed. I currently work in the private sector, but prior to this, in the span of seven years, I had five different positions in the government, with two of those serving as a supervisor. This might seem like a lot in a short time, but it actually isn't, and I'll explain why in this video. If you want to like, subscribe, or annoy YouTube since they remove dislike counts, feel free to do whatever you're feeling. Before going into all the reasons that government jobs don't pay, a couple overarching things. First, every state is different, so something may be true in one state and not another. The needs and funds are not going to be the same in all 50 states and territories. Also, not everyone is going to have the same experience. Second, the general common policy when it comes to media is to not comment. So if you're watching a documentary or a TV special and there's a blurb about no feedback from someone in a government position, this is usually why. It's often played as a gotcha moment, but it's misleading. To add to that, many states often have a designated media person. That is the point of contact for bureau or departments because they are supposed to understand the correct terminology to use and present a professional face for the state. This is also why it can be difficult to find specific policies as those documents are usually locked down and only available to employees. To put this in perspective, I'll provide an example from one of my jobs three years ago. During an event where I needed to run a booth about health information at a local mall, I was greeted by a journalist from a local paper asking for a quote. I let them know I can't provide one and thought nothing of it. The next day, my supervisor told me I was quoted in the paper and looked panicky, which confused me. Turns out, the journalist quoted me explaining what the booth was for. It was a factual statement and a sentence of less than 10 words, hence my confusion. However, because I was not the designated media contact for our bureau, I had to fill out a two-page form explaining what happened and essentially report myself. It was about two weeks for them to review my information and respond that it was okay and my statement was factual and there was no issue. So the next time you see that pop up, keep in mind that the person may want to respond but cannot due to policy and fear of losing their job. Third, because of the subject matter, I can't really call out a specific state or agency unless it's relevant to the particular item. Governments are also very litigious, so I have to be careful about mentioning too many specifics and in the information provided. I don't have resources to fight back, but I think these are things that people should be aware of. The first item to address is some terminology. If you go to a state's website to apply for a job, generally speaking, they will be split into two types of positions, classified and unclassified. Depending on the industry, these terms can have a wide variety of meanings and the definitions and wording vary. The best way I can think to explain what a classified job is, is that it's probably the closest that a government worker can be to having a union job. These are usually permanent positions that do not get eliminated and have some protections from being laid off. Also, a worker cannot generally be fired or terminated without going through a whole process first. Because these are also the most difficult jobs to get, most employees stay in these positions for a long time because of the security and associated benefits. What is becoming more common is unclassified positions. These are considered at will. Terminations can occur immediately and without explanation. The position can possibly disappear in the future, and the worker is at higher risk to be laid off. Over time, the number of unclassified positions greatly outnumbered those of classified. Often, as is what happened in my state, when an employee retires or leaves a classified position, the vacancy is then posted as an unclassified position at a lower wage. Within these two categories, an employee can either be salary, hourly, or hourly with comp time. Managerial and director positions are usually salaried positions. It's interesting I couldn't find many articles about how many hours on average that salaried government positions usually worked. As far as the private sector, however, in the linked 2014 article from the Washington Post, the average work week for 39% of salaried employees working full-time was 50 hours a week or more. As far as hourly, many states have a rigid rule that hourly employees cannot work over 40 hours at all. They still expect 50 hours of work to be completed, but you can't put in any overtime. 
and if it is an unclassified position, this can be grounds for termination. As far as hourly with comp time, what this means is that if an employee does work over 40 hours, the overage is considered comp time. So if a worker puts in 10 hours one day instead of eight, they have accumulated two hours of comp time instead of overtime. So instead of overtime, the employee can take two hours off at a later time without affecting any vacation or sick pay. Unfortunately, they often bank on the employee not actually using that comp time because if there is a cap, those are basically hours of free labor that the employee doesn't get any compensation or time off for. The employee will often get grief for using that comp time as well, and I can speak from experience on that. As far as benefits such as health insurance, for the most part it's the same for every government position. Unless an employee is working through a temp agency, every government employee will have the same access to paid time off, health insurance, and per diem. The last point for this section is the job descriptions themselves. Again, this applies to any job, but certainly government positions. The description is often conflated to sound far more complex than it actually is, or it's so vague that it gives an excuse to pile job duties on in a roundabout way. When you see other duties as necessary at the end, be cautious, especially if it is an unclassified salary posting. You can fill out my form here. Parents occupation. Please know. Homemaker is not allowed as it is not real work. That's why you don't get paid for it. Mm. Mark can take my place at the plant. Mm, but he so wanted to see women in the workplace. Well, how about Aunt Patty and Aunt Selma at the DMV? <laughs> Along with classified positions being replaced by unclassified positions, the wages for government employees is barely moving and, if I'm being nice, pathetic. To show how confusing this can look, According to ZipRecruiter, the average government employee salary is $63,659 a year, or roughly $31 an hour. Go ahead and look at the open positions in your state and tell me how many are $30 an hour or more, because this particular estimate is off. Indeed.com actually has the average closer to about $42,000 a year, or about $21 an hour, but the better source was Ballotpedia.org that actually split up the average by state. It also shows the average weekly wage across the United States with $932 a week, or roughly $23 an hour. Keep in mind, many government positions do not start at this rate. My first job with the government started at $12.50 an hour. Side note, the average starting rate for fast food stores in my area at that time was $11 an hour. The next job I moved up to was $13 an hour, and it wasn't until my fifth position working for the government that I had a wage above $20 an hour. It was $23 an hour, and that was two years ago. When applying for these jobs, it's rare to be able to negotiate the rate of pay. If a job is connected to a grant, the budget has to be adhered to, or the state may lose that funding. The grant will often outline requirements needed as well, so if someone is willing to work for a lower market rate, but is missing one qualification, the government may not be able to hire this person. The hiring process itself is very cumbersome, even without these issues. If a job is not connected to a grant, then it's usually the state legislature that determines the rate of pay, even for some positions that are federally funded. If you look at a job posting and it has a grade level pay, that's what it's referring to. The state legislature votes and approves the wages for government workers in the state. If they choose not to increase wages, then this pay scale remains stagnant. It is possible though. The public sectors I worked in generally had far more women employees than men. In one of my bureaus, they were wanting to hire a man out of college for one of the program positions. This is one that required a master's degree that he had, but he had no work experience. During his interview, he said he would accept if the pay was higher, so the director made this happen, and he was hired. This understandably upset one of the women employees that had been with the bureau for a year, also had a master's degree, and had work experience prior to being hired. When she heard what his starting pay was compared to hers, she petitioned to bump her salary to the same rate of pay as his. This was denied twice, and she left her job in the private sector soon after citing this incident. When I had enough of working for the state and found employment in the private sector, my supervisor wanted to know what would be needed to keep me there. I stated the pay that was offered to me and the ability to work from home. Of course, this was denied. Even if this had been granted, I would have rejected the offer due to several issues with my supervisor at that time, along with the accumulation of frustration and anger from my previous positions with the state. As far as raises, don't count on them. In a previous video, when I mentioned a coworker that started at 14 an hour and was in her job for several years, when the government approved a pay raise for the first time in way too long, 
Her pay bumped to 1470 an hour. The only way to increase your pay is to basically apply for another position. When I mentioned five positions in seven years, this is why. If I had stayed at my first job at $12.50 an hour, by the end of the seven years, I might have broken that $14 an hour wage. The fourth floor, small claims court, divorce filings, state order drug tests. It's somehow both freezing and humid. There's a whole room on the fourth floor where they store the knives they've confiscated from people who went to the fourth floor to stab someone. One of the reasons people were willing to take a bit of a pay cut is that until recently, government positions were one of the few places that offered benefits such as health insurance and a pension. During the 2008 recession, many people were willing to take jobs that didn't offer these benefits because they needed a job. This also allowed many states to be pickier about who they hired because they could start putting excessive requirements for different positions because they would be able to get the same work and pay less. Along with this, in my state, the governor that had been elected drastically slashed state budgets and eliminated many positions. One of the epidemiologists that I still talk to told me about the week that pink slips were being handed out left and right. Many employees were crying and upset, having had no clue that their position, or in a few cases, the entire bureau, would be eliminated. Well, not necessarily eliminated, but rather the job of three people would be combined into one. In the previous section about wages, I mentioned that there are not often raises or cost of living adjustments. Even though government employees get health insurance, the amount for this from their paycheck goes up every year. The wages don't increase, but if you want to keep those benefits, you lose more of your paycheck and suddenly working at a fast food place seems better because you can leave work at work for about the same take home pay. Pensions are one of the benefits that many companies have eliminated as well some replacing it with a 401k or nothing at all. Many states have not eliminated a pension because this is also what state legislators get benefits from, so they certainly aren't going to eliminate that. One of the other things that the government and sometimes private companies will tout is their additional benefits, such as paying for education. My state in particular really highlighted this. Since I was going back to get my master's, I looked into the program and discovered it was built in such a way it was never actually meant to be used. Again, this is determined by your state's legislature and representatives. Let's go through some of the key requirements. Only one class per semester would be reimbursed up to a set amount. Reimbursement would occur after proving the grade was a B or higher. Books and lab costs were usually not covered. It could not interfere with current work. This could mean work schedule, but it depended on the supervisor. It had to be part of the education requirement for that job. Well, what does that mean? In many of the job postings, there is a common phrasing. This position requires a bachelor's degree in a particular field or equivalent work experience. Work experience is defined as three years relevant experience per year of education. So basically 12 years relevant experience that the hiring supervisor and human resources will judge. This requirement alone would automatically disqualify most applicants because rarely was anyone hired based on years of experience and not education. When I looked into the full list, it was about three pages long. Eventually, this benefit was eliminated because no one used it and the people who designed it did not want this to be used. I will add a positive benefit that had a good impact. The veteran's preference does seem to be followed and considering how many other hurdles veterans face, at least this didn't seem to be one of them. 300 call number in the fine arts section? What is this, Beirut? You know, you don't work here. You don't have to reshelf the books. Well, someone has to. I'm so sorry. I'm just really stressed out. You're a great librarian, and I'm sure you're not the one who shelved this section. I am. God, Debbie, what is going on with you? The lack of training applies to both public and private sectors. Even if someone has education and previous job experience, the fact is, every place is different. There may be overarching similarities, but in order to have a more successful workplace, consistent and quality training should be provided. In the Real Colors blog linked below, quote, employee training is often appreciated by employees as it gives them a sense that there is some direction to what they are doing. It also shows that the organization is invested in the employee and wants to help better them. It provides a structure for employees that makes their job more secure. Employees will often feel more valued and appreciated when the owner of the company takes the time to offer training and professional development opportunities as part of the job, end quote. Training also benefits the company. In the linked article from Redshift, by not providing adequate training, employees are unhappier, more inefficient, less productive, 
create more mistakes, and can lose customers. One of the worst training methods is just handing a manual to a new employee and saying everything is in there. To have a productive and efficient workforce means putting in the effort to make that happen. When the legislature was cutting budgets for my state, one of the biggest cuts was training. Most employees, including myself, would just be given a manual and few key instructions on the first couple of days and then be left to our own devices. Part of this is because so many other employees were so overworked that fitting time in to provide hands-on training was frustrating and caused more headaches for them since it usually meant some of their work was not being done. And if their work wasn't being done, they were reprimanded. While some training can be done through manual, it's not as effective and doesn't do any good if the employee is not trained on how to use it or shown what resources to go to in order to find answers. In a past supervisor position, I created a manual for new employees. During the first week, I explained how to use it, where to find answers, and encouraged them to mark pages and move things in the binder around as needed. It also involved walking through scenarios and discussions about what to expect. Part of the reason for revamping training is because I had been frustrated at how little I received when I started because many of the mistakes I made could have been prevented. The reason training for government employees is important is because mistakes are handled very differently than those in the private sector. When it comes to government jobs, it doesn't matter if the mistake is fixed in the end, rather it turns into a game of who the blame can be placed on. In my second day as a government employee, I had misrouted a phone call by mistake out of confusion and lack of training. Even though other people in the phone chain had the knowledge to answer the question, I ended up receiving the blame because it was supposed to be my responsibility and was part of my job description. The person called back and complained to my supervisor, saying they were going to complain to the governor. I was given a first warning right up on my second day and then reprimanded for not knowing something that everyone else had known that had been there for years. Complaints like this to the governor should not be a reason for an employee's termination unless the employee was abusive, cursing, or threatening over the phone. The person that called in was a member of the public, not a government employee or elected official. Even though the person calling in was yelling and cursing at me, I had to take the abuse and I received the warning on my second day. Adequate training would have prevented this. This is just one example. Because of how different bureaus and departments are set up, the process is more important than speed. Historically, this has been to prevent corruption, create a paper trail, ensure accuracy, and create uniformity. However, it ends up creating more red tape and congestion. If a step is missed, the process steps can be traced to find where the mistake occurred. More often than not, when the mistake is found, the employee is reprimanded more harshly than needed. Processes are supposed to be set up in a way to prevent human error, but we are human and not perfect. When someone has been in their job with the government for 30 years or more, they forget what it's like to start over. They don't always recognize that the lack of training helps create an environment for this error to occur. By cultivating an environment where employees are terrified to make any mistake for fear of termination, it's encouraging them to cover them up. Unless you have a manager or director that's kind of your buddy, every mistake feels like it will result in termination no matter how small. Bill has a place upstate. The local sheriff says there's a car in the driveway right now. He must be there. Okay, they're gonna have to raid the place without us. It'll take us two hours to get up there. Or we could take- We are not taking a helicopter. You know I was gonna say chopper. Look, Peralta, I know you're having fun, but a helicopter is exactly the kind of wasteful expenditure that once will use to bury me if something goes wrong. Okay, sir. Or, it's the kind of thing she'll crucify me for not getting. You could have had a chopper, Raymond. Why don't you take advantage? Just a minute, my cauldron's boiling over. For a while, one of the popular mantras among different states was to start contracting everything out. The idea was that the government would maintain oversight of the contracts. In theory, that sounds nice. One of the problems is that it makes it easy to overload work for the government employee. The jobs I had during my work as a government employee were in health section. Within the health section, areas were also further divided by region. For example, 10 people would be part of the WIC program, but then those 10 people would be divided by region to oversee the program. If all the positions were filled, then it's not necessarily that bad. Unfortunately, as people leave or retire, job postings may be vacant for five years or longer. I'm not kidding on the five years one. Two of the jobs I had within the state haven't been filled for nearly three years and they're still posted today. An epidemiologist position was vacant for six years before they were able to find someone willing to take the position. The duties of the vacant position still need to be completed and are often handed over to the current employees. There usually isn't a major rush to fill these vacant positions either. 
The employees are then overworked and have to decide which items are higher priority. This may mean some tasks are incomplete for months at a time because of other issues. It created another problem. Some of the more menial jobs still needed to be filled, so that gap was addressed by hiring temp workers at an even lower wage with no benefits. Some were able to use that as a way to find a permanent job within the government. One of my friends tried to go this route and was hired into a temp position that they were told would turn into a state position, only to find out two years later it was always going to be a temp position. I believe that I've earned your vote. Bobby Newport believes he can buy it. And maybe that's because he's never earned anything his entire life. That, that hurt my feelings. That hurt my feelings. You're supposed to be this positive person. Can't we just talk about things we like? This applies to some states more than others, and I won't delve too far on this point for fear of litigation. In my state, when there is difficulty finding someone to fill some of the higher up positions, such as director or section manager, they are appointed by the governor or other elected official. The person may not have any qualifications or leadership skills, but because they have the right connections, they get the job. This happened in one of my bureaus, and because the person hired was insecure and unqualified, it made a decent work environment absolutely unbearable. I need to find someone to fill in for April. Now, I know I'm not gonna find someone who's both aggressively mean and apathetic. April really is the whole package. I wanna be your assistant. Really? You hate it here. So do you. So why go through all this information? We often want oversight to ensure the safety and well-being of those in the United States. The problem is not understanding how to have those positions of oversight filled with qualified and productive employees. For example, social workers. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the 2020 median pay was $51,760 a year or $24.88 an hour. Again, not everyone will start at that rate. According to socialworkguide.org, some are paid as little as $32,000 a year or $15 an hour. Some states also require that they stay within the 40-hour work week and not get overtime, or maybe salaried positions. This is a job that often requires a master's degree, specific licenses or certifications, and work experience. The cost of education is another video planned. There are also other videos that discuss how broken the system is in regards to child protective services, but I rarely see any discussion about the employees in charge of that. When the person handling a case is overworked, exhausted, and paid 15 an hour, it shouldn't be a surprise when they burn out or make errors. If we want to protect and take care of the vulnerable in our society, we need to have a system in place that makes that possible. Some states are also starting to loosen requirements for certain positions because they have been vacant for so long. A position that once required a four-year degree now only needs a GED. By doing this, it allows them to lower the wage because they can justify that the position no longer requires higher education. So how do we move forward? To start, consider who is in your local and state governments. Those are the ones making determinations about pay and qualifications. Hold them accountable, and if your state is the one that pays social workers $15 an hour, ask them why. This is the same group of people that determine the red tape in order for people to use programs such as WIC, food stamps, and unemployment. Hold your elected officials accountable. The employees working in government positions are not magical beings from another realm. They are your neighbor, your friend, family, friends, people in your community. They're people. In the Netflix series Made, it shows Alex's struggles with government assistance. It's not that the employees don't want to help but they're often in a work environment that does not reward them for going above and beyond, yet harshly reprimands and terminates for mistakes. They are bound by the rules and regulations that have been voted and approved for by the state and local governments. Look further into situations where someone receives blame for an incident. Chances are they are the lowest on the totem pole and cannot fight back. Government employees are supposed to follow procedures that have been created, and it's often easier to just terminate an employee rather than fix the system or investigate accusations to see if they're true. Even if the employee followed procedure and has a good work history and track record, it doesn't matter. If we start holding the decision makers accountable and start working to make effective changes in the system, 
then we can put effort towards ensuring that oversight is appropriately maintained, especially for child protective services. Thanks for making it this far. Until next time. Well, I suppose I should ask you what you do if I'm to be working with you. For me, Bob. For me. I am Springfield's chief hydrological and hydrodynamical engineer. Hydrological and hydrodynamical. Talk about running the gamut. Snigger all you like, Bob. Thank you. I believe I shall.